Thank you very much, Alec, and uh, thank you to CDC for uh, sponsoring event. Well, Africa, uh, as you'll be familiar, is uh, 53 countries, and we don't <laughs> generalize about everything from, let's say, West Brom to Vladivostok, or Alaska uh, to the Cape Horn. Uh, but we try to do that with Africa. And so what I will say tonight, I hope you treat as broad generalizations, and forgive me if I skate fast uh, over an incredibly complex and diverse environment. And that would be true if I was speaking about the present, and how much more so uh, when I talk about the next 40 years. Uh, that's a very long time. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with 2050 as a horizon because I don't think, uh, if I am around, you'll be able to do a performance appraisal on me then. <laughs> um, but uh, for many of you, I hope, you'll be able to reflect on this evening uh, and think about to what extent uh, I might be wrong, and certainly I'll be wrong, because all discussions about the future are wrong. And so what we try and do is think of what mega trends are. What are the big drivers, and how may, may we uh, begin to engage with them? And the most fundamental point about the future is that we have to create it. If we want Africa to claim the 21st century, we've got to make it happen. Africans have to make it happen, and we in Europe and elsewhere have to support them in that endeavor. And there are things we can do, and I hope I'll give you a flavor of those. I'm going to give a very wide presentation on the future, which is informed by my own life uh, and my deep conviction that the best minds in the best institutions uh, tend to get their thinking about the future wrong, uh, and that we live in a most extraordinary time where things do happen. And so just as I never expected to go back to South Africa in my lifetime, uh, we shouldn't think that things don't change. They change in the most remarkable ways, much quicker often than we anticipate, uh, and those changes come from unexpected places. This is true in politics around the world, uh, but it's also true in all other things we think about in the future. It's certainly true in technology, where famously the founders of IBM uh, or Bill Gates, and all of these people were at the frontiers of their technological development, were unable to see where their technologies were going. It's not because institutions um, are dull or don't have the necessary people in them. It's because we don't understand the, choice, the way that the world changes. And I've been associated with a particularly big fiasco uh, in this respect, because as an economist who's worked with the World Bank and others, I and uh, 20,000 other of my PhD colleagues didn't see the financial crisis coming. Why is this? And how do we think we can talk about the future of Africa if we can't even tell things three months apart? Not only we, but institutions whose job it is to talk about the future and think about the future and create a stable future. So predictions are not a very good idea. Um, and what we need to try and do is understand what's happening. And the most fundamental thing that's happening in this period as we look forward is that the nature of the world has changed. It's changed because of immense political transformation, ideological transformation, economic transformation, technological transformation that's occurred in our recent lifetimes. Uh, and the South African liberation was part of that as has been the case in many, many other countries across the world. 64 countries have become democratic uh, in the last 20 years, and a third of them in Africa. The Berlin Wall coming down, the end of the Cold War, uh, the opening up of China, the integration of Europe in the Maastricht Treaty, uh, the end of dictatorships in much of Latin America, Africa, uh, and Asia is a fundamental political transformation that has opened societies to new influences and forces that come from around the world. At the same time, there's been economic connectivity. The Uruguay round, capital market liberalization, trade barriers are now well under half of what they were uh, only 15 years ago. The density of container traffic, of internet traffic, of all other connectivity has multiplied something like tenfold uh, in the space of 20 years. This is a different time. This is a time of dense connectivity, of rapid transmission of ideas, of people physically and virtually being together around the world. And this will change the outlook for Africa. The yellow here reflects 
how long it takes for people to get to a megacity of over 5 million people. And what you see is that the majority of the world's population are less than three hours away from a megacity. Uh, that's the yellow. Africa included because of the megacities in Africa, apart from the Sahel and other desert regions and parts of the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is physical and virtual connectivity of a scale, intensity never seen before in human history. And with this comes new possibility. With this also comes new hazard, and I'll talk about both of them. Urbanization has been a major force, of course, and this will continue to drive creativity. When people come together, as we know from London, as we know from events like tonight, and as we know from across the globe, when people come together, they share ideas, and they change their views, and they advance. And so urbanization creates economic growth, as well, of course, being driven by it. This will continue, and a significant number of the megacities will be in Africa. So we live in this remarkable time of turbocharged globalization, a tidal wave of globalization, where despite the world's population increasing by about 2 billion people, income has increased more rapidly. Now, this has never happened in human history, except for a very interesting little period about 1,000 years ago when Islamic and Christian civilizations met each other. That was a renaissance as were the renaissances in Italy, uh, in London, and other cities, when people came together for the first time, shared ideas, and suddenly leaped generations in their ability to innovate. That's what we're going through now. And we will continue to go through this. So the person that's written this recent book, The End of Innovation, I think has got it fundamentally wrong. We're at the beginning of a huge innovation wave, or we're in the middle of a huge innovation wave. This will continue, and will continue because we are more connected, because there's more migration, because there's more virtual connectivity, and because there's more money to support it. You see this as one reflection uh, in this graphic, where you see that from about 1990, when the Berlin Wall fall, fell, when all these other forces I've talked about began to take place, when South Africa and Africa opened up, the level of these flows, and this is just financial flows, but the same thing applies if you look at other flows, trade flows, internet traffic, etc. The level of these flows is fundamentally different. This is foreign direct investment. That's what migrants send home. That's aid flows, and that's bond and equity flows. And what you see is a change in the orders of magnitude of these flows. Very, very unstable. They certainly concentrated, and if you wish, we'll come back to that in conversation but different orders of magnitude. And this, of course, creates opportunity because when you put financial flows together with innovation and markets, you get growth. These are other ways of looking at the same thing, which is just openness and restrictiveness indices. And what you see in both emerging and developed countries, restrictiveness slowing down, openness increasing, and this is a global phenomenon. It certainly applies to Africa too, although much more needs to be done because the problem from, for Africa, as we will come back to, is 53 countries, tiny economies, many of them, an aggregate unable to play its role because of the restrictions across Africa. And so it is that less than 10% of African trade is with other African countries. This needs to be changed. Globalization has been a liberating force for many. It's led to an increase in life expectancy of about 20 years over a period of about 25 years. It took from the Stone Age to this period to achieve this. So this is something very different to what's happened. Illiteracy has gone down from about half to about a quarter of the world's population, and the number of people living under this desperately poor marker of a dollar a day uh, has gone down by about 300 million, despite the world's population going up by about 2 billion. For those that believe that development doesn't happen, uh, they don't understand the data. It happens, and it happens in revolutionary ways for many people. Of course, the problem is that many people have not benefited from this. Too many, well over a billion, and many of them in Africa. And so the challenge has to be, how does one make globalization inclusive? And will it become more or less inclusive over the next decades in Africa? Because global inequality is increasing. It's increasing between countries, and it's increasing within countries. It is one of the other sides of the globalization coin. This is extremely worrying because you see this acceleration in globalization in the period of, uh, of inequality in the period of globalization and projected to increase. If you take out the bottom billion and the failed states, there's a convergence. 
There's a convergence because developing countries are growing much more rapidly. Uh, their economies, wealth is increasing much more rapidly than ours. And this is particularly true after the recent crisis. But if you include all the failed states and the many countries like Zimbabwe, inequality is increasing. This is an ethical blot on humanity uh, and clearly it's a major challenge to globalization. Globalization cannot be sustained uh, with this growing inequality. Now, let me turn from where we are in the world to broad patterns that we are likely to emerge over the next 40 years and then focus down on Africa. The world's population is going through a major shift over this period, declining in many parts of the world. The uncertainties in this area, and these are the UN projections, are enormous. An uncertainty range of about 4 billion people, that's about two-thirds of the current population, only 40 years out. This makes a huge difference for everything we can think about going forward. Climate change, the environment, markets, and everything else. Where are we likely to be? I think it's likely to be towards the bottom of this. Because as you see from this regional breakdown, all regions, including Africa, are coming off their long term, which is the dotted trajectories. It's only Africa that's going to be above replacement levels by 2050. All other regions will be sinking dramatically. And as I'll come back to, this is one of Africa's biggest opportunities, the demographic dividend going forward. Now, clearly, population is driven by two key drivers going forward. One is how long people will live for, and the other is um, how many people will be born. The story on life expectancy, with the notable exception of Southern Africa, is remarkably consistent around the world, which is about two years increase per decade in life expectancy. There's also convergence, and this is likely for reasons which I'll touch on very briefly to be extremely conservative. So your life expectancy this evening is going to increase by about a minute uh, while you're here. And that's the combination of the public health knowledge that is being created, so you know, wear your safety belt, don't smoke, whatever, and the work going on in labs around the world uh, to improve the technology frontier. But is it so for Africans? And we'll come back to this. The much more dramatic story and the differentiated story than fertility is that, uh, sorry, than longevity is that of fertility. And what you see here is that only Africa is above replacement level in 2050. A collapse of fertility around the world. And this is for multiple reasons uh, which are now well known. It's mainly about women's education, women getting jobs, the cost of having children rising, whether it's their accommodation or their schooling, uh, relative to the benefits of them being with you afterwards. So as we move from a society in which having young people herding your goats is a good way to insure against your future to a situation where actually putting your money in investments and housing or in the bank is a better way, uh, we move to having less and less kid children. And large instabilities uh, emerged in this process. And so we have to change our mental map of the world from population pyramids to population coffins. This is the future for most of the world. Different speeds, different dimensions, but totally different demographic structures to those which our societies are premised on. Note some other things, major gender imbalances uh, across this at different cohorts. And this will be even more the case in societies like China, where if you're going to only have one child and you live in a society where having a boy gives you higher rewards than having a girl, then, and you have the technologies to select, then you have, as you see here, 20 million more boys than girls uh, in the bottom cohort. Now, this has dramatic downward spiraling effects on future demographics in these countries, as well as all sorts of other effects as well. But I'm not here to talk about China or Italy and Europe. I'm here to talk about Africa. And so one of the questions is, can migration make up these huge imbalances, the pressures that will be placed on young people, and the decline in the workforce of the rich countries over this period to 2050 from about 800 million to 600 million. Well, even if migration levels were five times the current level, it still wouldn't begin to compensate for this. I believe very strongly that there should be more migration, that there should be more skilled and unskilled migration, that there will be. And when we revisit 
these discussions in years to come, we'll find this period we're going through as very unusual. And rather than trying to keep out migrants, we'll be desperately searching for skilled and unskilled people from around the world. But the societies that the migrants are coming from will be going through even more dramatic demographic transitions and economic transitions than the societies they go into. And so the big question will be, where will the migrants come from? And that's because the growth rates in emerging markets will continue to outpace those uh, in the rich countries by a long way. They will grow two, three, four times the pace of the old rich countries. And as we suffer from our crisis that we've come through and not listen to the lessons of the 1980s and 1990s, the emerging markets have. So they're in good shape, and they will robustly continue to grow at these sorts of rates for decades to come. Now, sub-Saharan Africa doesn't look that great compared to China and South Asia. But compared to the old rich countries, it'll be growing at double or triple their rates. And I'll come back to some of these numbers. The projected per capita income as a result of the BRICS, and I really do insist on having the S in the BRICS with South Africa as well, um, as you see, goes up very rapidly over this period. So rapid per capita income and total income growth in emerging markets, with China very rapidly becoming the largest economy in the world and the center of economic gravity moving to Asia over this period that we're take, talking about. Let me just quickly move from some of the global social and economic megatrends to some of the technology megatrends that we're likely to see in this period uh, going up to 2050, focusing particularly on some of the frontier technologies which are likely to become ubiquitous. Driving these is the continued power of Moore's law. And when you speak to the computer scientists, they tell you that this is robust, at least for the next 30 or 40 years. What does that mean? It means that computer power in 2050 will be about 10 million times more powerful than the computer power we have now, at least for the same price. It means that just in, like our pocket uh, phones and devices are more powerful than the Apollo space program, just like we can go down to Dixon's and buy a terabyte of information for, uh, storage for um, 80 pounds. That was the total installed computing power capacity in the UK 50 years ago. So we're entering into more rapid growth uh, and uh, super power levels within this which look like they're sustainable. The question is, what will it do for Africa? So this curve is becoming steeper. It will inform everything around us. It will certainly inform the commercial and other channels. And it's associated with this information big bang where more information is being processed digitally uh, now every six months than ever said and created in the history of humanity. This is accelerating. And so by 2050, what we should expect is a world of total connectivity uh, around the world. And of course, Africa has to be that. So overcoming the digital divide is a crucial challenge. So just as the future will be extremely rapid and connected, it will also be invisibly small. This is from our lab as well in Oxford. This is a nano needle going through a cell membrane. The dimensions are 44 billionths of a second through a membrane, four billionths of a meter. This is invisible. The future will be a future of invisible sensors, devices, machines, connectivities, uh, which will inform where we are, what we are, and maybe who we are in terms of our thinking. There will also be medical miracles. This is the incipient part of one that by 2050, which should be ubiquitously available. But will it be for Africa and poor Africans? This is a stem cell created from a cardiac cell, uh, again, in our stem cell institute in the Oxford Martin School. We know that all parts of the body come from single cell groups. We know they can be directed and that the technologies are developing towards this. So regenerative medicine will be gone through a revolution by 2050. People will be more able to live longer and healthier, although many of the neurological diseases are unlikely to be. There will also be huge advances in genetic and other areas. This is the cost of DNA synthesizing going down exponentially as computer power increases. This brings enormous potential for all sorts of genetic advances, but it also brings hazards because you can recreate a smallpox or Ebola 
uh, through this for decreasing cost. And I'll come back to some of those risks. So as we think about 2050, let's not think about the world we have now and trying to project into it the technologies we have now, the opportunities we have now. We have to imagine a world, a world where there's totally different what communi telecommunication systems, totally different uh, networks, and there shall be health opportunities, at least for those that can afford them. And so one of the biggest questions will be is, does all this development deepen the structural divide or narrow the structural divide between the poor and the rich and between poor parts of Africa and rich parts of Africa or rich parts of the world? Can Africa seize these technologies to leapfrog? This is extremely important because it's likely that these technologies will define dynamic comparative advantage going forward. It's also likely that whatever that is happening um, on the economic and social front, technological front, is likely to be overshadowed by major other systemic forces, including uh, climate change. And I'll come back to the effect of climate change on Africa. But what you see here is the center of the problem. And this is a project, as you can see, I was rather success unsuccessfully involved in. This is the Aral Sea. What we have is the tragedy of the commons. We have a situation which is the situation that Africans have known for time immemorial, which is what's rational for one person, for one herdsman, or for one country, uh, is not rational at the collective level. And as we move to this super-connected world, what we need to think about is do we have the capacity to manage it? Do we have the capacity to manage the global commons as we become more and more able to exploit it? And the answer is certainly not in. As we've seen in fisheries, these collapses are irreversible often for very long times. The North Atlantic cod population has not begun to be restored. Now, Africa particularly needs to overcome the commons problem for itself because it's 53 countries, but also it needs to, the world to overcome it. Africa, as we'll see, is most vulnerable to climate change and all sorts of other global commons challenges. And so a key question thinking about 2050 is will global governance improve? There's some wonderful examples of places that have managed to do this. This is the Mediterranean rock of Gibraltar. And what you see from these examples is that it can be done, but it requires a combination of scientific knowledge, collective action by citizens, and decisive action by politicians. This is needed in climate change. It's almost certain that we're heading towards very significant average increases in temperature because we're doing too little too late. The implications are dramatic. We need to reduce our carbon emissions uh, to, in the UK, about 20% at least of what they are now. Africa does not have a problem generally with climate emissions apart from South Africa. But it needs to ensure it can develop without adding to the global problem, and it can't be stopped in that process. It would be totally unethical for the world to say to developing countries, sorry, we've filled the atmosphere with carbon, uh, you need to stop your development. You need to stop your transport and energy production. So what are the answers? The answer is one, ubiquitous technology, ensuring that the new technologies are widely dispersed. But this is a big, big, not only technological question, as well as behavior and economic question. It's also ensuring that as countries develop, and as these individuals get their own cars and their own transport systems and their own energy systems, they helped in doing so in a way that meets their development aspirations without destroying the world's. And so this trade-off between how you get there is crucial. Now, let me turn to Africa and just emphasize through this map from 1970 that we need to think forward, and this is only 40 years ago, 40 years hence, how different Africa will be. And when we look at the map of Africa from 40 years ago, we recognize the fundamental changes that have happened. The way that whole societies have been restructured, the political map redrawn, the nature of Africans and their confidence in themselves, their view of themselves in the world changed. Unfortunately, the world hasn't changed with it. The world tends to be stuck in a mindset which is long gone. The, the Mobutus, the Idi Amins of this world. This was 40 years ago, less. And of course, 
the South African story, the transformation which has been so rapid uh, that we often take for granted that it doesn't happen even faster. And so in 2010, we moved from this Africa of the past to a situation where in one year alone, there were 20 elections on the continent. This, I believe, is a sustainable trend. I believe it will be reinforced by the technologies because people with communication, with knowledge, will demand more rights. It will also be reinforced as we move up the economic scale. Now, what's remarkable about Africa is you see that it's grown more rapidly over this period from 2000 to 2011 than all the emerging markets, and second only to uh, India and China. This is an extraordinary story, and it's a different one for Africa, which was, of course, contracting over a very long period of time. What's also remarkable is the bounce back from this crisis, the resilience, and that's because the macro house is in order. Africa has learned the lessons of the 1980s. It's learned about macroeconomic orthodoxy. The Af Africa is applying the Maastricht Treaty criteria in a way the Europeans can't begin to do. So there's no Greece in Africa. Uh, there's not that sort of situation. The convergence around orthodoxy is astounding. The ability of Africans to govern their own economies is one of the big turnaround stories of this period. And I believe this is sustainable. What's also interesting, and this is contested data, is that the Gini coefficient, which is inequality, an economist's measure of inequality, is declining. And this is so that implies that the economic growth has been more inclusive than in the past. And this is extremely important, not only for the ability of politicians to deliver reform and continued growth, but also in terms, of course, of poverty reduction. Now, sub-Saharan Africa has still a tiny share of the global economy, and if you add all of these up, these regions up, you still don't get to 2%. So we're coming from a very, very low base. And the question is, how quickly can this base be grown? It is a low base, um, and it's very varied. North African, higher, and Southern Africa uh, over this long period before, lower. But the interesting thing about the period of, since 2000 is that the average has been above 4%. Indeed, last year, the average was, uh, for this period since 2000, was 5.6% for Africa. This is remarkably high growth. Rate. The UK has never achieved in its history a sustained growth of 5.6% period over a 10-year period of time. So one should, and that's an average for the countries of sub-Saharan Africa. So this is an achievement that is formidable. Now, turning to the other mega trends, and particularly to population, we see a very different story. And the tragedy of Africa, of course, particularly southern Africa, has been this, the collapse in life expectancy. So while the whole world, as I indicated, has seen a 20-year average increase in life expectancy, uh, southern Africa, over the same period of time, has seen a 20-year decrease in life expectancy. And this is the story, largely, of HIV AIDS. And you see it here where countries that had attained life expectancy in their 60s now uh, is down into their 30s or low 40s. This clearly needs to be addressed dramatically. But what you see for the continent as a whole, taking out, uh, or even including in this, in this graphic, the Southern African story, is this enormously rapid population growth. You also see very significant improvements in literacy across the continent, and you see an improvement in poverty reduction over this period. So the Millennium Development Goal target 2015 is unlikely to be achieved, but there has been remarkable progress on average towards achieving it. As I indicated, inequality going down. There are also very many other encouraging signs in this recent period, including the improving business environment. And so what you see in the World Bank's doing business surveys is Africa high above the others and very high in these top group of countries in reforming countries to make them more business friendly. And you see here, again, World Bank data that Sub-Saharan Africa is the most active reformer in the market. So these are extremely encouraging signs and they go against the tide of opinion one hears too often about how bad Africa is and how it's going backward. And of course, what the private sector sees is this reform, and so the flows have increased. Now, looking forward to the next 40 years, you see a very powerful story of a potential demographic dividend. 
the African labor force will be much more than double of that in Europe. And as you'll see, it, it's going to be greater than China's. Very rapid urbanization over this period, uh, which I think is an extremely positive force for reasons I alluded to, and much healthier demographic pyramids across the continent. What you find in this is that Africa, because of the youthfulness of its population, and the youngest population in the world is now Uganda, uh, average 15, uh, compared to Japan, average 50, uh, you have that contrast and you get a fantastic demographic dividend already and playing through into this period. Skewed, all sorts of anomalies, not least because of HIV AIDS, and that has to be dealt with. Aggressive choices, which bring in the global community as well, have to be made to deal with the scourge. But it is possible, and when one looks through this, one can reverse these sorts of scenarios. This is Botswana, how it should have been, and Botswana with HIV AIDS. And you see how HIV AIDS has completely destroyed what would have been a very healthy population pyramid. So this needs to be addressed aggressively and done. But even taking all of this into account, Africa still becomes the largest labor force in the world by 2040, exceeding China and India's. And of course, if it can do the right thing, Africa will be highly competitive with these countries because their labor costs would have gone up uh, and their resource endowments are much lower. So Africa has two big things going for it, people and resources. Can it exercise these options? Can it do the right thing? And part of the right thing, of course, for Africa has to be making it one labor market, not 53. Can it do that? Can it allow freer flow of people across its borders, restrict, reduce the restrictions that now make it a very fragmented market? If it can, it can seize the 21st century. It also needs to educate its labor forces. It needs to, and these are the projections of how it can to 2050, it needs to ensure that people are literate and able to engage in all sorts of ways, in civil society and in markets. And what you see in these projections is a very optimistic story of increased higher and higher levels of education. But clearly, education is key as the software of development, as is questions of the hardware, ports, infrastructure, power, rail, telecommunications, vitally. Growing number of people going out to 2050 that are educated, rapidly declining number of people projected to have no education at all. Absolutely vital as a source of optimism for the future. And so when you look through these numbers and you look through these projections of education and labor market growth, you get into rather optimistic pictures of what Africa can do in the future and how its per capita incomes can grow uh, and be well over at 4.8 thousand, that's $4,800 per capita uh, in today's prices. Very four times the current level uh, of incomes. And its share of the average global GDP going up uh, from 11 of, of incomes, 11% to 32%. It's still not at the level one we want it to be, but it's a very, very major improvement from where it is now. And you can do this with the different countries running through where it would take them in terms of their per capita incomes and how wealthy they would be um, were this to come about. And what you see everywhere is this very, very positive story of incomes which are not wealthy, but certainly are at a par where many European countries were 50 years ago or 40 years ago, for example. China and India still have much more rapid growth over this period to 2050, but a very steady growth of average incomes in Africa going up to approaching $5,000 per capita in today's prices, which is enough to live decently and to engage in society in a very meaningful way. It's also enough to ensure your society eradicates poverty of the type we know it now. The big threat to Africa, of course, comes from climate change. It comes from this devastating picture that, for example, this, is, this picture paints, um, and this is IPCC data. 
of enormous change in rainfall, precipitation, uh, and average temperatures. And people that are vulnerable are, of course, the poorest. It's the poorest who are most susceptible to very, very small changes or to one year's harvest collapsing, being killed. Right. And you can't really see that this doesn't seem to be very in focus, but this is minus 50 to 60 percent change in precipitation in the Maghreb region and down here in southern Africa. And this is minus 10, minus 15 percent in those hues of orange and yellow. Dramatically drier. And that's not accounting for when the rain comes, the intensity of the rainfall, and all the other things we know will change with climate change. And so the growing seasons change. Uh, you have far less growing days. And unless there's major technological change, which I'm very engaged in trying to support as well and believe should happen, we're not going to have the food and other resources to feed the populations in Africa. But there is potential in all sorts of agricultural technologies uh, which allow some source of optimism. The question is, will they be supported fast enough, widely enough, to enable us to make that? And of course, the water story is a dramatic one, too. There's going to have to be a shift of water out of agriculture. There's going to have to be mass desalination in the coastal areas. This is possible, and by that time, hopefully, at prices which will be affordable. We can already desalinate water for far less than this costs in the shops. But is it affordable to poor people uh, in Africa, and will they be near sources of desalination? So moving water out of agriculture is key, which means, of course, making agriculture more efficient. There's also an upside to climate change, potentially. And that is, if we change the world to become more solar dependent, Africa has an intense comparative advantage, as this intensity of light uh, graphic shows. So we can imagine Africa is a massive exporter of, for example, solar power to Europe over this. And this is Desert Tech uh, technology, which you might be familiar with. A major project to power Europe out of Africa. This is not unrealistic. Major groups like Deutsche Bank and Siemens and others are already investigating uh, this project. Africa also has a comparative advantage in hydropower. Ingwe, for example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo could power the whole of Africa if it was properly harnessed. So there's potential. It needs to be realized. Africa's mineral resources, we know, are a source of enormous potential. Already, Africa ranks very highly in many of the core minerals that will drive the future. But its potential is much greater. Can Africa realize this potential without suffering from the resource curse? The resource curse of overvalued exchange rates this resource curse of conflict, of capture, of corruption that we know too well. This is a big governance challenge, not only for Africa, but the world. There has to be a bargain. The anything uh, but arms sorts of agreements have to be pushed forward so that Africa can export its natural resources, but equally the extractive industry transparency initiative, publish what you pay, transparency initiatives need to be followed. Rich countries need to be accountable as do African, for ensuring that these resources are extracted in a way that benefits the whole population. The level of conflict in Africa has greatly reduced in, re in recent years. It is possible to manage this as part of a global, it cannot only be African, as part of a global deal. But whether this will happen depends on what happens if this natural resource extraction, who gets the rents. The other bizarre thing about globalization is it's given great power to small groups of individuals. Pirates have returned, not least to Africa. Small groups of individuals in states which are poorly governed can wreak havoc to global systems. This is true in container traffic, it's true in the internet, and it's true in many other ways. So how the world deals with this and how Africa deals with rogue groups and rogue countries of different types is going to be absolutely crucial as well in ensuring that it's able to claim the 21st century. What Africans know, of course, and poor people know everywhere, is that they are most affected by shocks. So although the projected growth rates of Africa are very, very robust, 5% going out to 2050, one should also recognize that these systemic shocks that will come increasingly in the future, the other side of globalization, the connected shocks that come from elsewhere will affect Africa more dramatically than elsewhere. So Africa has this very strong interest, maybe stronger than anywhere else, in ensuring that global governance works. 
that the financial system is properly managed, that pandemics are controlled, and that many other dimensions of systemic shock are, are held back. The problem with the world that we're entering to, into over the next 40 years is that the upside potential is enormous, but the downside potential is equally great. Because globalization provides such rapid opportunity, it also provides, through the same mechanisms, this connectivity, this proximity, this intensity and speed of transmission, it also provides the, the channels for the transmission of shock. And so as Africa gets more connected, it will also become more vulnerable to these global shocks. And so managing, becoming resilient, developing the mechanisms becomes vital. This group of people are meeting tomorrow uh, in Seoul, Korea. And one has to ask oneself, will they be able to deal with these challenges? Would they and their successes be creating the world that the Africans will be able to profit from? And I'm not optimistic. This set of institutions, and I've worked in and with many of them, has many, many assets. But they are not dealing with the challenges of the 21st century. So we need to accelerate the global governance process. We need to ensure that we're not just simply rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, but that we are aggressively putting forward a development agenda at the global level, which allows an inclusive globalization. If it doesn't do that, globalization will be challenged. There will be protectionism, xenophobia, and reversals. And that will be extremely damaging to everyone's prospects in the UK and elsewhere, but particularly to Africans and those that depend on enhanced connectivity to ensure that they can escape their poverty. This is a tidal wave we're riding. It's a very difficult process of balance. It's one that has to be mastered with great skill and requires many people from around the world coming together to work. If they can do so, they can ensure a very bright future for themselves and the African people. Thank you. Very, very uh, inspiring, um, uh, and you sort of surfed your way through um, many of many of the issues with with great aplomb. And I, I was hugely struck by any number of things you said. I mean, particularly, you know, this issue of technology, which I think people, when they look at Africa from afar, don't appreciate uh, enough the importance that it's having in 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 changing countries. I'm thinking of the mobile phone revolution um, in countries like Kenya uh, and, 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 and so on. So I will certainly, I will, when I get back home tonight, I will send a quick email to my friend doing his remote development project in Mauritania and say, keep the faith. <laughs> I have the vision. Um, that said, uh, there are, of course, as uh, uh, our, our friends in Washington uh, would say in a slightly overused um, uh, saying, there are one or two elephants in the room. Um, and one of those is, is the issue of governance. And uh, for many of these uh, uh, developments uh, to reach fruition, Africa does badly need, in many, many countries, better governance. So what I'd like to do is open uh, the session up to questions, but I'm going to take the liberty of asking, putting a couple of questions in first, and then... Uh, I would urge you to, to, if at all possible, uh, to pose questions rather than uh, deliver homilies or, or exegeses, because there's time for those uh, afterwards, and it'd be very interesting uh, to hear them. But what we really want to do is, is hear what Ian has, has to say. But, so my couple of questions are, uh, are, the, are the following. You have been, as it were, around the block in Africa uh, a lot, and you have seen uh, the problems of governments at, at close hand, even as you have tried to... Uh, affect major development projects and often often with uh, with success but how do you square this vision of 2050 with the reality which is that even in uh, Africa's most dare I say, sort of important uh, countries I'm thinking particularly of South Africa Kenya Nigeria uh, there are major major uh, problems uh, within the governing elite and major questions about uh, the commitment of those governments uh, uh, to the right end. So how do you reconcile that reality with, uh, with the vision? And, and the other one, uh, uh, given that many in our audience here are, I'm sure, generous philanthropic 
uh, souls, back to your, your um, old um, uh, uh, mission, uh, you've been working in development for a, for a very long time. Um, and in recent years, there's been a sort of reappraisal of uh, what development has achieved in Africa and what it, what it should achieve. And it's been sort of famously encapsulated in a trenchant book by a young Zambian economist, uh, Dead Aid, who sort of wielded a Zambian machete uh, uh, through the development undergrowth and said it's all a complete disaster. Um, and that uh, uh, the West has meddled too much and should, uh, uh, and, and, and should desist. I just wonder if you could very briefly yep. uh, say what you think about that as well. Um, I have been to, to many African countries, um, but I've also been to Asia and Latin America and elsewhere uh, in talking about economic reform uh, and talking about investment and many other things. When we, when we talk about the opportunities of Asia, we don't talk about Burma or the corruption in Indonesia, or anything else as being a major impediment to Asia's future. When we talk about Europe, we don't talk about what happened on our doorstep in Bosnia uh, and elsewhere. And when we talk about Latin America, we don't write it off because of Venezuela and a number of other places, which are really disasters in governance and in other respects. And yet we do it with Africa. And I think we really need to get over this problem uh, rapidly. Africa has 53 countries. There are terrible failed states with dictatorships who are doing barbaric things. Uh, but there are more countries moving in the right direction than anywhere else I know. And yes, uh, it is a very poor neighborhood uh, for South Africa and for many other countries to be next to a Zimbabwe or next to uh, even the Democratic Republic of Congo. And there's many, many other countries one can cite. But I don't see that as blotting the African story. I see it as being a major problem for Africa and for the world, and a lot of these problems are created by and with the world's participation. Um, but I don't see it as being something that stops one being positive about a whole lot of other African countries. Now, Africa has to be held to account. Um, you know, the sorts of things that many people are doing, Transparency International, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, the World Bank with its doing business surveys, and many, many of these initiatives, the NGO things, EITI, uh, publish what you pay. These are wonderful things, the Kimberley process. These are good, good things that will hold Africans to account and direct investment and trade uh, to countries which are hopefully doing better things and create positive incentives. But I don't have a vision of Africa from my experience there as ha somehow being better. And one of the really strange things about my five years running an infrastructure bank um, that covered 16 countries in Africa, and a concrete tends to be a corrupt business, uh, as you know, is that in my experience, and we were the biggest lenders in many countries, including Zambia and many others, which have a, a mixed record. I was never, and I'm not aware of any of my colleagues, and we pushed the forensic auditors to find the trails, never aware of any bribes, offered or made. So um, I don't think it's naivety. I think the, the, the picture that's painted uh, is broad generalizations, which doesn't bear reality on the ground. The, the, the second question on Dambisa and, and aid. Dambisa's a friend. I think her book is wrong. Um, Aid is not dead. Aid is like all other forces that the world tries to exercise, like trade and others, to help societies engage. It's a very mixed story. The world gave $10 billion of aid to Mobutu. All it did was keep him and his cronies in power. But small amounts of money given for other things have been hugely successful. What's happening, for example, in the global public goods, like malaria, like river blindness, like the CGI system on agricultural productivity, is amazingly productive aid. What's happening in many countries on getting girls into school, on opening clinics, is amazingly productive. And to sort of paint aid as generally bad, I think, is, is absolutely wrong. I think it's bad uh, analysis, and I think it's bad for Africa. Africa needs detail. It needs the understanding that some aid is good, some aid is bad, and you need to make sure that you put aid behind reformers and behind good projects. That's very possible. There needs to be much more aid, more predictable aid, uh, but higher quality aid too.